Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to uh, today's GeoTalk Online, and thank you so much for joining us. It's wonderful to have you with us. Today we have a speaker from Bits Geosciences itself, and that is Glenn Nawila, who is a senior lecturer in the School of Geosciences, and um, he's been working really hard to uh, do the very interesting research thrusts, one of which uh, he's going to speak about tonight. So I'll introduce him very quickly. Glenn um, has degrees in both geology and chemical engineering uh, from South African universities and a PhD in geochemistry from the University of Würzburg in Germany. Uh, but he's also got a lot of industry experience uh, in several different uh, gold mining companies, as well as industry, uh, industry experience as a consultant in the geological industry. He is, as you probably heard in his previous geo talk, if you attended that live, is a strong advocate for integrating machine learning and uh, numerical modeling into geosciences. And he's also received new, numerous awards, including the South African Rising Star Award in the minerals and mining industry sector. And we are very proud to have Glenn as a member of our team at WITS Geosciences, and we look forward to his talk this evening. So Glenn, thank you very much for offering to give this talk. And you can now unmute and you can share your screen and we'll get you loaded up. Okay, give me one moment then to change to your video feed. Okay, you can go full screen then and you are now live. So thank you everyone and enjoy the talk. Thank you, John. And thanks everyone for making time to come and attend this talk. For the first time after my last talk, which was mainly on machine learning, but for the purpose of this talk, we go back to the fundamentals of geology, uh, mainly the red space, in which is where I have spent most of my time uh, working at. So for the purpose of today, I'll mainly focus on the Black Reef. And um, upon speaking about the Black Reef, I'll also speak about the significance of some of the basement rocks that we have in the country not only here in South Africa, but everywhere else. And we'll use this to build up a case study of vast type gold mineralization. So this particular talk forms part of a series of publications of which uh, the latest one was published uh, just last month in Oil Geology Reviews. And I was working with a number of people that are listed here as collaborators. Uh, there is something that always uh, intrigue my mind and many people do ask me the same question is why bother continue studying the rats because all the projections are actually showing that by 2040 most of the easily accessible mines will no longer be operational and as much as we we'll still have one of the largest reserves of gold uh, not everyone will be interested in investing in mining for them and many people will actually look at the cap that you see on on the left hand side of the screen, which was compiled by Chris Hartnett in 2005, where he actually came up with, with a number of models that looks at the peak gold production in the country. And when we try to come back in the 1990s and to where we are at the moment, where we are straddling between 140 and 160 kilograms uh, per annum from something that we used to produce almost a ton of gold. And this brings the question of saying that we do have resources that are easy to target or that we should go for, uh, because now everyone speaks of critical raw materials. So the Bushveld complex being the host of over 80% of the global uh, PGE resource, many people think this will be the easiest target to go for, because at least it's more relevant, there's still more future. So on the right hand side here, it's a conceptual, a stage model that we have started compiling about the results of the PGEs and you can see we are still not very really sure whether we have reached the peak of platinum production in South Africa but that is besides the point we can still mine PGEs for the next 100 years or even more where else gold its days are numbered but there is something that keeps me motivated about studying the vets firstly the vets is one of the most unique 
or the largest anomaly of gold that is known in the world. The second thing that is more fascinating about the Beth's Basin is that you will notice that we have gold in a number of deposits and they are listed above here, as you can see in the legend. But if you check in the Mesoarchean, this is where we have some of the largest gold concentration. And the question now comes to say that is the Vex Basin unique in the world? Is it uh, the only source of mineralization that we have? And where does all this gold come from? And to answer this question, I have to first uh, bring you to some of the basics that many people who have worked in the, in the Vex for over 130 years have managed to come up with. So people have looked for similar type of mineralization because every time whenever you have such a large deposit, everyone wants to own one. And for this reason, it means in each and every country there were a number of exploration campaigns. So there is some sort of a list that has been compiled that looks at the similarities and the differences in terms of the so-called VETS type gold deposits or gold occurrences. Uh, there are a number of references that I could have cited, but due to limitation in space, there are a few of them that you can look into. But one key thing that many people agree on is that there tend to be some similarities in terms of the style of mineralization. And the paragenesis of this type of gold deposits is more dependent on, or, or on the atmospheric os, uh, oxygen concentration. The other thing is, which is the purpose of this talk, is that the hinterland tend to be something along the Archean or Paleopreterese granite greenstone terrains in all cases. So therefore, without even going further, the VEX is not really unique because it does occur globally, but we need to find out what is making it more interesting and what is making it more unique and where does the Black Reef come in in this picture. So for this again, we need to start from where all the things started. So the debate about where the Vets gold come from, including uranium and pyrite, uh, knowledge has evolved over time. And if you look back, there are publications that date back as 1916 by Melo, who proposed that uh, the concentration of gold in the Vets basin was in a form of, uh, of placer mineralization. Whereas in the 1930s, there was a change uh, in terms of school of thought where Others propose that this is indeed a magmatic deposit. It has nothing to do with placer mineralization. And then later on, uh, quite more recent in, in 1994, uh, there was a proposal to say that we know everywhere else in the world where we have these meteorite impacts, we tend to have some sort of mineralization of some sort. So it's not a coincidence that here in South Africa we we'll also have the Fredford meteorite impact. So this may also explain the mineralization that we have in the basin. And that I will also touch on later. But however, like anything else, the debates became so mature in a way that there were a number of school of thoughts. The first one, uh, people proposed that mineralization came or was introduced by hydrothermal fluids. And with this, there are a number of people who have worked with these prominent people that I can mention, people such as Andy Bunnicott, Neil Phillips, and Jonathan Law, among others. And then others, uh, stated that this is indeed a placer deposit, but it was modified. And with this, it means we initially had some sort of detrital particles that were mobilized by diagenetic fluids. And later on, uh, due to post-depositional alteration, we had a number of processes that changed the primary composition of the mineralization. And then um, more recently, but it's not very recent, because even in, in, in the mid 80s, the way people were speaking about this, uh, the models of syn genetic origin of gold became uh, more prominent, but it doesn't mean that they were widely accepted. And I will say that from my side, much of the change came around 2014 or 20, uh, and 2015 uh, when uh, two independent people looked into this. One is Hartwig Trimmel, who has happened to be my PhD supervisor. The other one is uh, Christoph Heinrich. We actually looked into a number of things and the first thing they wanted to understand is where is the source of gold in the Vets Basin and with this they come up with a model to say that we don't need a particular source because the conditions in the Mesoarchean were quite right for a number of things and with this I also worked on my PhD was which was mainly focusing on shales but the moral of their story or the current understanding based on what they have managed to produce 
is that in the hinterland itself, we did have some sort of background concentration of gold. And at the time, because we had things such as CO2 degassing, and we had high or high levels of chemical weathering, it means one can actually leach out the gold and concentrate it from the hinterland itself. And with this, it means pre-concentration of gold was actually dissolved in rivers. And for us to have precipitation of this, this is where um, Hartwig and, Hei uh, and, 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 and Heinrich differ because one proposes that uh, precipitation of this gold can happen in a form of oxidation, while the other one says uh, precipitation occurred due to more of reduction. So in the early days or in the early earth, uh, it has been confirmed or proven that we did have some sort of early life forms in a form of cyanobacteria. So this actually acted as some of the main uh, uh, oxida oxidation agent. And this is where we had the first precipitation of this gold. So over time, people wanted to also know the evidence because there's also a debate of which the, whether what we call microbial mats are uh, indeed remnants of well-preserved early life form or these are hydrocarbons. We're just not looking at things such as uraninite polymerization along these hydrocarbons. But there is a number of evidence that competes of which is not going to be the focus of my talk, where many people do argue that some of this material as present in uh, oiliferous conglomerates such as the carbon leader reef are actually representative of remnants of early life forms. So with this, knowing that these are quite delicate sedimentary structures, it means they are quite prone to mechanical reworking over time. So if we were to assume that much of the gold was uh, crystallized or, or, or precipitated in these uh, delicate structures, over time, it means there is a lot or they are more prone to being mechanically reworked by fluvial activities or iolian activities or whatever form of a process that may occur. And with this, it also means that we don't need a particular source to point at when we look at the gold concentration in the vats, but we need to look at the chemistry of the atmosphere and the hydrosphere at the time. And this also entails that most of the reefs that occurs far much later within the vet basin are actually a product of reworking. And this can also answer questions such as if we say this is anyhow closer to a place of deposit, why don't we have gold nuggets? Of course, if uh, further uh, reworking of the material has occurred, as we can see in this diagram that I have illustrated with the help of a friend, Lina, it shows here at the bottom that where we have the carbon leader, this is where the first concentration has happened. But over time, you had all this reworking that led to the formation of other reef types, such as the Midley Flay Reef, the Livingstone Reef, among many others. So there is over 26 types of these reefs within the vet space. And so this diagram, you can have a look at it. It actually just try to illustrate the type of environment that was existing at the type at the time of the vet space. And but particularly, you can also look at uh, the granite greenstone terrain, which occurs in the hinterland. So this led me now to say that um, my main focus is not really at the vets, but is to look at, can we find something similar to it? And what else do we have in here? So this took me to a journey where I had to understand whether there is some mineralization in the black reef and in what form does it occur? Because people have mined the black reef before. And then the other thing is, is to also look if there is any relationship between the vets itself and some of the mineralization in the black reef, or the black reef is quite unique in its own composition and fluid inclusions. And then the other thing is, is to also look at whether any part of this post-depositional alteration may have led to some development of fracture patterns that may have assisted in gold redistribution. And then lastly, is to develop some sort of a genetic model that may guide some exploration of similar deposits elsewhere. So to do this, of course, the Black Reef occurs in many places, not only limited to the vets uh, gold fields, and I will also touch into that basis, but my main focus uh, was mainly around the West Rand area, which is the Carltonville gold field, of course, comparing it with other sites where uh, a similar deposit was started. And to do this, uh, just for those who are not fully initiated in the vets, 
you will notice that we have a number of, of, of gold fields. I will only speak of nine major ones that you can see in here. So Carltonville is just around here where the study area is and it's about 80 to 85 kilometers uh, from Johannesburg. So if you look at the right hand side, this is a map that was uh, compiled a while back. I have just added additional things into it. Uh, this is some of the mines that we find in the Carltonville Goldfield. Uh, some of them are still operational. Some of the shafts are closed. So it means I also had to rely on uh, surface boreholes that were drilled before even these shafts were sank. And what you see here, you will notice that we also have an outcrop of the Black Reef north of that. So what I will show you on the next slide <clears throat> is what had to be done as part of this project because this project didn't start last year or this year. So firstly, it was mainly locating all these old boreholes that were drilled and speaking to people who have been working in these gold fields for many years. I also had to do a lot of underground mapping. <clears throat> as you can see the pictures here, so I actually grew up in these gold fields, mapping a number of them. And what you see here are the different forms of the Black Reef. And what you will actually notice, you will notice that we do have some where we have a series of conglomerates uh, where we, we, we have in between them some carbonaceous shales, which tend to form much of the hanging wall. Sometimes you only have one thick conglomerate unit and the hanging wall becomes the shale or patches of shale and some uh, gray wakes. And then in here, sometimes you find these highly, uh, uh, these conglomerates that are rich in pyrite. So you find a number of them and other people have observed the, the same thing in other gold fields. So from these, um, all these boreholes that were drilled were utilized to actually try to locate how does the Black Reef geometry looks like in this west strand. And from this, it helped me to actually reconstruct the model that you see in here. The advantage of this is that in the Carltonville Goldfields, it's one of the few places where the Black Reef intersects more than three types of reefs. So it intersects the richest carbon leader, it goes to the Midley Flay Reef, and then it also intersects the Livingstone Reefs and, and, and the VCR. So this gets more interesting because in other places you'll find that it's only subcropping against the Kimberley Reef or one minor reef or one primary reef, where else in the Carltonville there is something that is quite unique in here. And this is the best place that I think that one can test whether the vets basin had anything to do with gold mineralization in the vets or in the Black Reef, or it has nothing to do with that. Gold was concentrated by other processes that has nothing to do with the vets. So to do this, once I had established that was actually to relook at some of the data that was compiled in terms of uh, the paleo channels and also to look at where exactly we have the maximum or the minimum thickness or so a number of boreholes were drilled and some of them were drilled by me and uh, what we have found here is that uh, the payload current directions or indicators are showing a number of directions some of them are quite dominant but it shows that most of the sediments came from the north and some of them from the uh, northwest and a number of places as you can see here but what is quite interesting that you can see on these this is where they are currently mining in the Carltonville gold field that you can see here. And what you will notice, uh, I'll just get a pen quickly. What you will notice is that where I said there is an intersection, it's actually sitting somewhere here. This is not the place where the Black Reef has the maximum thickness in terms of the stratigraphic thickness, but this is where the Black Reef has one of the highest thickness when it comes to the conglomerates that are, uh, that are mineralized. And when you go further north, we actually don't have conglomerates. Sometimes you only have a contact between a shale unit and uh, an underlying quartzite unit from the vet basin. And we have a number of these uh, where I'm currently uh, residing in Renfontein. There's also a mine five kilometers from my house where they are mining something similar exactly like this, but it's actually not running along these three major reefs. And then from this, we did some work which also resulted in one MSC and a publication that we did with a number of people in 2017-18 and we're actually looking at the fractures that may exist in the Black Reef and we notice that all, you, all what you see in here uh, where you have the intensity of these colors and clusters, this is where we have some of the highest concentration of fractures in the Black Reef and this, uh, this section was taken very close to where they are mining in the, in the Carltonville Goldfield and it also show other layers 
And among that, it also shows some of the faults that were active uh, during the time of the Black Rift deposition, and some of them that occurred even before that, below it, and some that are far much later. But the advantage of this, it shows, showed us there are some areas within the Caltonville uh, gold field where we may not see all the fractures and the structures, but they are quite structurally complex because we looked at the orientation of these things. They appear to be randomly orientated in a number of places except the major structures. And with this, we're busy building up our story. Uh, of course, one cannot speak of any type of gold mineralization without consulting or doing much of the petrographic work in the lab. So we also spend a number of, of hours in the lab. And with this, what you will see here is different forms of uh, ore minerals. And with this, I just selected pyrite. But of course, there is more than pyrite in the Black Reef. And the gold also to show where it occurs, how is it located, what is it related to. But one thing that actually came as uh, unexpected for me is this type of pyrite that you see here, which is the concentrically laminated pyrite that we probed and we found that it also contained very high amount of gold. Among that, there are a number of pyrite grains that you see in here. The other thing that you'll also notice is this pyrobutamine that is actually not that this butamine in here. It tends to occur also very close to where we find gold. So you find gold sometimes sitting inside the quartz fracture, and you will see more of these pictures later on. Sometimes you find this irregular gold grain. Some of them do have some sort of a shape that you can make up. And then the other thing is when you separate these pyrites, because I also did some REOS dating into them, you will notice that we have these ones that have some striation and they look cubic in nature uh, in morphology but also also have the sub rounded ones that you find in here and these sub rounded ones some of them do contain some mineralization of gold among among other um, minerals there is also uraninite in this usually occurring with parabutamine which uh, for the sake of space i didn't include so the assemblage actually does mimic what people have observed observed in the vets, just that maybe the morphology of some of the minerals are quite unique to the Black Reef, such as some, some of these large gold grains that we find in the Black Reef, which are not very common in the vets. And then from this, we look at fluid inclusions. And if you look at fluid inclusions, we notice that there are a number of phases. There's actually about three main phases. Uh, but uh, the first phase uh, is mainly a two phase, uh, which is dominated by liquid and vapor. And then we also have another one, which is more of vapor dominant. And where, if you look at the heating temperature here, these are not very really high temperature fluids. Uh, it's running around 171 degrees centigrade. And then the freezing temperature is also around minus 4.7 uh, degrees Celsius. And then the salinity is about seven, as you can see here, sodium chloride. And then what was more interesting to me was not just uh, temperatures in, uh, uh, of the fluid or crystallization, it was mainly the composition of this fluid. You will notice that majority of them are more of liquid dominated. We also have CO2, then we also have things such as hydrogen sulfide, as you can see in here, which is quite critical in many places as an agent that tends to attract or complex gold in many places. Then we also have some hydrocarbons that you observe in a form of CH2 in here. And the wavelength intensity, you can see that the scale is quite wide as compared to some of the ore deposits elsewhere. And then from this, now that we understand the fluids and so forth, it was mainly to understand where the sum of uh, what are some of the protosources of these um, rocks that we find in the Black Reef? And, and to do this, we actually look at the trital zircon grains. We looked at a number of them and we analyzed them. And at the same time, coincidentally, I was not aware of this. There was also another group which uh, includes Amin Zer and uh, Alan Wilson and Excel who were actually looking at exactly the same thing. Uh, our papers nearly got published exactly the same time, but what you will notice is that we found exactly the same numbers. Uh, the maximum age of deposition in the Black Reef is around uh, 2.6 million years, because that is one piece that was missing before. People used to infer this based on stratigraphic correlation on a long range, but now we can find uh, more of a uh, high precision age. But what was more interesting for me, it was actually the distribution of 
the edges, if you look in here, we're looking at an edge that is around 3050. And with these, if you correlate with any surrounding rocks that are on the side of the Black Reef or that we find along the Black Reef, you will notice that most of them are either granites and some of them are greenstone rocks in a number of places. And some of them have been dated to match this particular age. So with this, it assisted us to start building up a story which I will tell in the next number of slides. So with this, it was now to sit down and understand and combine all this form of evidence. So from the detrital zircon grains, one can clearly see that most of them were either supplied either from the north, coming from the Petersburg basement, uh, Petersburg block basement, or they may be coming uh, as uh, from things such as the vet space in Okomola or the Fenterstone. But what is more interesting is that where we look at very close to where we are mining the vets, you'll also notice that there is an age that is equivalent to some of the ages that were found in the vet space in the basin by people who have studied similar or, or, or not exactly similar rocks, but studied the vets, the trital zircons. So there are a number of people who have looked into this and we found that we find a similar assemblage in terms of age distribution besides the maximum age of distribution. The other thing that we know from a number of uh, work that was done by people and also from physical observation is that the vets reefs have been subject to various cycles of erosion and deformation. And this can actually lead us to the very first stage on how gold was introduced in the Black Reef, because unlike what people are saying to say that there is no way that we have anything that was mechanically derived in the Black Reef, when you look at the Carltonville Goldfield, it's a classic example where you'll find these thick conglomerates and pyrites that are actually matching the signatures coming either from the VETS or the Frentenstrup supergroup, and with these one can now start saying that there were some repeated cycles of weathering and erosion which enabled sourcing of this gold from the vets and it was deposited in more of prefer preferential sites of the black reef because as soon as you move far away from the vets reefs within the Carltonville Goldfield, you will notice that there is a significant change in terms of gold endowment, including where you still find some sort of pebble legs type of conglomerates or some thick packages of the conglomerates. In addition to that, you will notice that uh, one thing that we have noticed is that the shape of uh, the gold grains around these areas, not all of them are indicative of more of irregular shape, they do form some degree of local transportation and sourcing. And with this section, I just want to illustrate that at least part of the gold may have been introduced by mechanical reworking, as we can see closer to the gold fields. But the story doesn't end there, because one thing that I have showed you was a map that is showing fractures. So the Black Reef, just like the Vets, has suffered a number of things. Uh, those who are not initiated to the subject, I will have to uh, tell a bit of this story that we do have the so-called Fred Ford meteorite impact. And with this, thanks to a number of people such as Roger Gibson, uh, Uwe Raymond, and among a number of people who have studied the, uh, the Fred Ford meteorite impact, because we now know that about 220 million years, uh, uh, 20, 20 million years ago, a mountain-sized asteroid or comet of about 10 kilometer in diameter traveling at very far higher speed smashed the earth about 15 kilometers to the modern day or present day parades. And the explosion of this was so high or was so magnanimous in a way that uh, the estimation is that it is equivalent to 100 million tons of TNT, which created a crater of greater than 300 kilometers. And with this, at the center of which lies a 90 kilometer wide region of abdoming and it heavily damaged a number of rocks and with this i will show you evidence of this that we have observed in the, uh, in the black reef and how this lead us to how the majority of or, or the most of the gold in the black reef was concentrated so with this what you will see in here is just some sort of stratigraphy here to guide people to say that rocks that were not supposed to be visible today are actually revealed because of the Fred Ford meteorite impact. Some people do credit it also to say that for us to even have the vets basin today in South Africa, we can actually uh, thank the Fred Ford meteorite impact because it exposed over far deeply buried layers of rocks as we can see today. 
And this evidence occurs in a number of things. Uh, again, uh, the photos, I credit them to Roger. He has uh, passed them to me. You will notice that some of the basement granites and fragments of these granites are quite exposed along or very close to the Fredford meteorite impact. But what I want to tell you here is that look at some of these microfractures that we find in the Black Reef in a microscopic scale. You will find this uh, very aligned or gold filling these microfractures, and some of them are actually occurring within these hydrocarbons or this bitumen. Uh, or reduced carbon, and what you will see here is a scatter of gold and some of the ore constituents. And then with this, there's also some of the gold that occurs along the margins or the surfaces of pyrite. We have these large or different forms of, or, of carbon. We have this nodular carbon, which is quite interesting, but we also have some of these very well elongated uh, carbon. But on top of that, we have various forms of quads, of which some of it occurs in the form of chat. It is quite strained in many places. So with this, we can see that there has been a time where the Black Reef has really benefited from the uh, greatest geological catastrophe, which is the Fred Ford meteorite impact. So with this in mind, it actually assists me to explain why we also have gold in the Black Reef away from where we have the vest reefs, and actually what is the significance of this in other areas, such as in Jacobina, where people are saying that this is not really uh, a place that deposit, there is actually an element of hydrothermal region. So based on this, you can see that the Fred Ford meteorite impact actually created a number of these microfractures, and some of these old folds were reactivated, and many people have written about this. But one thing that also happened is that gold, including other ore constituents, were, was mobilized not only from the vets, but plus other crustal sources that people can find in places such as in the Barberton, where the Black Reef is uh, without any, any vets or the French stop and among the number of places. And with this, it means gold was transported in some sort of a, 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 a hydrogen sulfide complexes. And thanks to the advances in uh, thermodynamics, because based on the Chatelier's principle, it means that uh, we can predict the deposition of gold uh, that it will actually occur because of the decrease in the activity of hydrogen sulfide and the change in oxygen fugacity. So what you see here on the diagram in the right hand side, you will notice that much of the fluids that I have mentioned in the Black Reef are sitting around 170 degrees, which puts us somewhere along this regime. And uh, the temperatures uh, of metamorphism that has been suffered by much of the rocks in the Black Reef, including the fats, uh, people are estimating they pick around 350 degrees Celsius. So we can, we can now say that let's not focus on the right segment of this, but let's only look into this segment in here. And what you will notice here, you will notice that much of the gold was actually in a form of either a complex bisulfide of some kind, uh, in the form of hydrogen sulfide. And we need something else now to ensure that we precipitate this gold. So let's take we are sourcing some of this additional gold from the vets and much of it is being concentrated locally and some of it is some of the really low grade of background concentration from, from uh, the hinterland or whatever rocks that we have. So unlike the vets where um, many people have said precipitation occurred due to oxidation, in the Black Reef, I tend to believe that precipitation of gold in the second stage of mineralization occurred because of chemical reduction, where we actually had reduction of gold three plus to gold zero. And this can happen in this form, either in a form of the hydrocarbons or reduced carbon acting as a reductant, or we can actually have uh, some of the sulfidation of the ion bearing minerals that assist in the precipitation of gold. And this is the reason we find some of this gold being close to pyrite grains or along the surfaces of them, because those do act as uh, appropriate site for reduction. And if you look at away from the vets, away from the vet reefs, this is what you will see. You will notice that there is a very high amount of faulting and fracturing that occur in here, where people have argued such as, uh, have argued matters to say that much of this gold is actually uh, occurring in quartz veins and structurally controlled. How can you link this to, 
to, to the vets at all if we can concentrate gold in this form and I have indicated in that diagram. But one thing we have noticed is that even if we were to dispute the occurrence of vet rigs contributing in a form of mechanical reworking, you will notice that in sites such as the Carlton Ville Goldfield, we do have a lot of this localized reworking of sediments. Whereas when you look at far away from this, you will notice here that we have a different forms of occurrences where these normal falls that also allowed the movement of the fluids and so forth. But where we find gold is mainly in these thrust duplex structures, which I have zoomed in here. And what you see here is gold, uranium, and, and, and pyrite, uranite and pyrite, occurring okay, in very tiny scales. So this does show that these cluster rocks or some of these basement rocks did have some amount of gold and it was sourced by secondary processes at some point. And the Fred effort did play a major role. What you see here is an image of a shutter cone showing some of the damage that was induced into these particular rocks or the rocks. So with this, um, many people have looked and spent a lot of time uh, very close to the vet space, including myself and uh, people such as Sebastian Fuchs have done incredible work in uh, looking at not only within the gold fields, expanding their horizon somewhere else, but we are actually now also trying to say that uh, does the hypothesis that we're putting to say that much of the gold was precipitated by reduction and transported uh, and sourced from crustal sources. Does it exist in many places where the black reef may occur away from the vet basin? And what role did this uh, granite greenstone rocks uh, play? And for this, I had to revisit one of the old publications, which was done in 1969, that showed some uranium and gold mineralization uh, that was found in uh, hydrocarbons. Along the uh, very uh, along the eastern Transvaal Annals, and this was published a while ago. So for this, we are busy formulating uh, uh, a proposal for a new research project that will not only look into this side, but will look in uh, other side with Christoph and 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 Hartwig Freemel. So we will advertise a position for an MS uh, at an MSc level to undertake uh, this project, continuing with this work among others. And with this, just to conclude on this, uh, as I have showed you the conclusion on the second or third slide where when we started, uh, if you were to put this in a map, you will notice that there is actually a lot of similarities in terms of these occurrences where much of the secondary mineralization is, is brought by sourcing of the gold from the hinterland, from these granite crystal bells. And despite the depletion of accessible high grade uh, all bodies in the vet space, and you can see that the lessons that we learn on the mechanism and the mode of both occurrence is not only limited to the vets, but occur in a number of places, including where we don't have them as a deposit. And in this uh, map here, what you will see is that uh, gold deposits that are interpreted to have been formed before the global oxidation event are actually occurring with, uh, with, uh, with with uraninite and pyrite, whereas those that were formed later, such as the tapa deposits in Ghana, these tend to be found with uh, magnetite and hematite or other iron oxide minerals. And with this, I would like to say thank you for your attention and for your time. Glenn, thank you very much. That was a really interesting talk and a wonderful uh, alternative take on uh, gold mineralization in this very important region. So thank you for taking the time out, um, especially with pre preparing for online teaching, to uh, to give us that talk. Um, I'm sure the audience out there appreciated it. And of course, now is the time for the audience out there to ask questions of Glenn. And so if you have um, any questions that you'd like to pose to Glenn, just uh, type them into the Q&A bar on the right hand side of your screen and we'll we'll read them out. And whilst people are typing out those questions. I've got a question for you, Glenn, and it's something that, that's really fascinated me a lot about Witt's gold mineralization, and I wonder if it has any implications for the Black Reef. And that is the, I guess, maybe the fourth hypothesis about uh, the biological um, action that precipitates gold. So, so this biologically mediated um, mineralization in, in the origin of gold. Does that have any significance in, in the Black Reef? Um, as it may in the vets, or is it, was it a very much a combined kind of? Uh, 
a, a slightly different story with the black drift because people have looked into this and this diagram that you see here uh, summarizes that to say that what we have in the black drift are mainly hydrocarbons, meaning that these are not in situ uh, microbial mats, whereas in the vets, um, around 2001 or so, there was a study that was conducted and they found that uh, if you look at the number of N alkanes and the fractionation of carbon-13, uh, there is more consistent in what they have interpreted as uh, microbial mats. But when you look at things such as the black reef, we find pyrobutamin and you can see here uh, as the number of N alkane increases, uh, the fractionation levels also decreases significantly. And for this reason, it's actually two mode of occurrence. So we didn't have the same conditions that we had in the vets. We didn't have this in situ microbial, uh, microbial mats at the time of the black reef, but we had more of migrating hydrocarbons, which assisted in trapping and uh, assisting as a reductant for gold precipitation. And do you think that hydrocarbon movement is, is somehow linked to the Freda Fort, or is that a much earlier um, uh, the, hydrocarbon movement? There is a number of hypotheses in this, but I would like to believe that the Freda Fort did assist in migration of a number of these because it did allow the activation of permeability. You can imagine that much of these uh, basins were quite dry at the time and uh, much of the pores were closed. So for you to have such carbon nodules and so forth, it means the fractures uh, which were created during the Fred Hoth's time played a significant role in assisting with the migration of these uh, hydrocarbons. Okay, um, and then Lou asks a question, which is uh, kind of linked to mine, but I think it's slightly different. Uh, first of all, nice, well-presented and illustrated talk, Glenn. The question, is there any conclusive diagnostic property that can distinguish microbial from magmatic gold, e.g. E geochemistry, texture, or other potential evidence, or is this microbial origin just a pipe dream? Uh, I'll, I'll say two things. One, there is no one who has done a detailed organic chemistry study uh, more recently. People have done this. DJ Mossman did this in the 1980s and so forth. And then the last one that was done in detail was uh, this study by, uh, by, by Hartwig, I think around 2001. And then there were a number of separate things. And with this, the only line of evidence that people rely on is actually the fact that these structures that you see in this diagram here are quite delicate, uh, by, are quite delicate to have been formed uh, by any migrating uh, hydrocarbons. And then the second one is that the isotope composition that was done does indicate some sort of something that was formed in situ. And aside from that, I don't know of any other evidence that anyone has presented that was very conclusive besides these two sets of evidence that I'm showing on the screen. Okay, well, uh, oh, another question has just popped up, just in time. <laughs> uh, this is from Anonymous. It says, what about the gold in the Dominion Reef? I presume they're talking about the origin of gold in the Dominion Reef. Oh yes, uh, we, we, we looked into that. Remember, the gold in the Dominion is not as much as the one in the Feds. So these are not exactly the same uh, type of gold deposits uh, as what we have in the Black Reef. So it's actually a different regime. I mean, the time that it was formed is a different regime to the to to. to to, to the Black Reef. So I, I, I have never studied the Dominion Reef in detail besides reading about it and so forth. And uh, it will be difficult for me to actually say that there is any link or mode of occurrence that is related to the Black Reef. Okay, Glenn, well, thank you very much. It sounds like certainly from some of these, the questions and answers that there is a lot of research that can be done uh, in the Witz Basin and, and, and all the gold um, in the province. So that's really exciting. and. I know it's a big thrust that you're driving in, in Chimera, so uh, that's really exciting, um, especially for all the students that are out there listening. Um, and thank you once again for the talk, much appreciated. Uh, we just want to also pass our thanks to John Hancock from CCIC Coal for funding these geo talks. Um, and then I'm just very quickly going to share with you the talk for next week. Uh, Glenn, you can stay in the video there. Um, and I'm just going to share very quickly that. Um, 
advertisement. There we go. So next week's talk is by Renee Boyson, who is a PhD student uh, in the School of Geosciences at WITS, and she'll be talking about uh, some of the results from her PhD, looking at innovative developments in multi-sensor hyperspectral remote sensing in mineral exploration. So we look forward to that. And Glenn, thank you once again for the great talk. We'll see everyone out there. And there were just, just for records, there were about well, over 40 people watching this talk online. So thank you all for joining us and we hope to see you next week.